Good morning, folks, and thank you all so much for coming out to the third of our weekly live Q&As for our Spring Curious Minds series presented by Hollywood Suite. Um, over the next two hours, we are going to be checking in with each of our four spring lecturers uh, who will be joining us for 20 minute live Q&As in which they'll answer some of the great questions that you sent us this week in response to their third lectures. Uh, just a quick reminder that if uh, you're planning to join us for our sessions at 10.30, 11 and 11.30, you'll need to refresh your browser at those times. So just click the URL link at the top of your screen and hit enter or return. But in the meantime, uh, we are delighted to be kicking off our festivities as we always do uh, with the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Mike Daly, uh, who took us to some very exciting places uh, in his third lecture this week. Uh, he dove into the fascinating music of Pete Seeger. Uh, he introduced us to some wonderful music by Harry Belafonte. He even busted out his banjo. So lots for us to discuss this morning. Um, and as always, I want to ask you all to join me from the comforts of your home uh, in giving your warmest curious minds welcome <clears throat> to Dr. Mike Daly. Thank you, Will. In times like these, uh, banjos are needed uh, now more than ever. So if anybody has a banjo at home that you haven't played in a while, I, we need it now. So thanks for your great questions. I'll just get right to uh, some of these questions that have been passed along to me. So Tim writes, the great footage of Harry Belafonte got me thinking again about race in relation to folk music. Is there a misconception that the folk revival and the folk genre in general was mostly led by white musicians? Do we sometimes overlook the importance of Belafonte and other people of color in this movement? I think that in retrospect, especially we do, which is kind of ironic because usually it's the other way around that we, um, looking back historically at a period of time in a, you know, a music style or a, a movement in music, we, we tend to look back retrospectively and see it in more, with more diversity than it was seen at the time. But at the time, and, and um, you know, Part of it has to do with the, the effect that the record industry has on music. And let me explain that. That there, there was, there's the grassroots level of the folk revival. And I, I talk about that in the, in the last lecture as being the kind of platonic ideal of the hootenanny. That is the informal song sharing uh, workshop hangout not so much a concert, but a shared experience of singing songs, learning songs, and you know, it, be, it being kind of a, a, a musical activity that bypasses the commercial music industry, something that's almost completely foreign to us today. We can't even get our heads around music that doesn't circulate through um, you know, recorded music or movies or television but actual unmediated music, learning songs the old fashioned way orally. So there's that, that sort of bottom level or grassroots level. And then there's the coffee house level or the venue level where you have um, singers who are doing gigs, either uh, passing the hat or passing the basket for money. And so they're not being paid by the venue. It's a very sort of low stakes economic model and uh, kind of flying under the radar of the commercial music business and the folk world in the 50s um, begins to develop that infrastructure late 50s right the coffee houses begin and i've begun to talk about that uh, especially talking about yorkville which is my specialty and in that world that that kind of develops in the late 50s and early 1960s there's quite a lot of di diversity, actually, <clears throat> especially uh, singers, uh, African-American, African-Canadian singers. And I've seen this a lot in my studies of listings and who was playing in the Yorkville coffee houses, for example, uh, where we see there was it was not all white singers. It was uh, 
uh, African American singers like uh, Brock Peters, Val Pringle, Josh White Sr. and Jr., Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, as well as some uh, African Canadian singers like Al Cromwell. And the thing about these singers is that we tend, when they recorded, and when we think of them today, we tend to think of them as blues singers. Now, in actuality, what most of these singers was doing was a, a wide variety of folk material, which could include blues, spirituals, calypso songs. There was, the, the, the types of songs that they sang were, were not exactly the same type of repertoire that the white folk singers were singing. However, they were squarely within that second level uh, of live venues. And then when you get up into the third level of the recording business, well, first of all, it was very skewed how many African American or African Canadian musicians even got to record in a folk style. Odetta was one, uh, Belafonte was one, though he was marketed not really as a folk musician, but as a calypso musician, even though the music that he was doing was quite varied and he was doing all kinds of songs that we consider to be within the folk repertoire. We talk about Lead Belly, uh, for example, but Lead Belly only really comes to prominence through the cover version of his song, Good Night Irene, by a white group, the Weavers. Uh, those, and by the way, the Weavers, the Almanacs, they were trying to, uh, uh, well, the Almanacs were certainly trying to integrate their groups and uh, it didn't it didn't always uh, uh, work for them and they did find some resistance trying to do this in the in the 1940s so what I'm saying is that the the genre uh, obsession of the popular music recording industry uh, tends to put people in boxes and often on the basis of skin color. And so if we see a black man with a guitar, we think of him as blues, no matter what he's singing. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is if you went into the, if you went into the Purple Onion in Yorkville in 1962 on a typical day, you could almost just as easily see an African-American performer or African-Canadian performer as you could a white Cana or European-American or European-Canadian performer. So hope that answers your question. Cheryl writes, the great Her uh, Harry Belafonte clips made me realize just how diverse the sound of the folk genre is. Yes, we tend to, again, when we look retrospectively at, at the folk period, we think of these sort of iconic figures who tend to be white, uh, which was also underscored by your forays into the blues and country and the labor movement in previous lectures. By the post-war decades, is it fair to say that there were a lot of different subgenres of folk music? And are there any other weird or wacky subgenres we haven't yet discussed? Yes, there are a lot of branches and tendrils of folk music that uh, I've mentioned in passing. Um, I've tended to uh, unfortunately fall into the same thing of sort of uh, centering my attention on what we conventionally think of as the uh, as the folk music movement or the folk revival, uh, especially as it leads into the peak of 1963 and 1964, which was very dominated by Bob Dylan. Uh, I think. Yeah, there are a lot of what I maybe um, an area that I would have liked to spend more time on is the traditionalist um, area where of people who like the New Lost City Ramblers, these musicians who um, looked at the the recordings of the 1920s, especially those sort of old time uh, string band. Uh, country, like proto-country recordings um, of the 1920s and studied them as if they were holy writ and tried to basically just reproduce those sounds uh, but in the present. And the traditionalist segment is uh, one that uh, has been strong since the 1950s 
and there is it's almost like a form of classical music where they where they see um, the way that those uh, musicians played and they just want to emulate that they just want to um, basically uh, assimilate and, and dissect that and continue to present it and just say look this stuff was was uh, incredible as it was let's keep this great music alive and um, th those traditionalists often um, are sort of put in the background in uh, the way that we historicize the folk revival, but they were there. I mean, the, there was a strong traditional traditionalist bent in the folk revival that has been kind of blocked out by the topical song movement and uh, the idea of you know writing songs to address present realities, which of course would have huge currency in the 1960s. George writes in the song Brave General Wolf, the vocals reminded me of the drone of bagpipes. Is that the intention in the composition or just unique to this particular arrangement? That is unique. Well, it's it's characteristic of this arrangement. The song itself, Brave General Wolf, is a ballad. That is, it is a single melody. And so you can arrange it any way you want. You can harmonize it any way you want. And so the group that we heard singing it uh, chose to do it in a kind of British droney open fifth style. And what I mean by that, it's a open fifth uh, or a fifth or a fourth is a musical interval. That is, it's the distance between two notes and those sounds, which by the way, I like, so a fifth is this, and this is a fourth. Those move around those fifths it gives you that that really sort of resonant um, bagpipe folk sound and that's what they're going for and uh, so that was that's their way of trying to idiomatically uh, treat that music so uh, yeah anyway it's particular to that arrangement Jillian writes Pete Seeger showed great courage in facing down the House Un-American Activities Committee. Were there any notable figures in the folk music movement who, like the filmmaker Elia Kazan in Hollywood, did name names and later had their reputation suffer for it? And were there many other folk stars who were blacklisted? Well, yes. Um, I talked about the publication Counterattack and its uh, red channels, the listing of people in the entertainment business who uh, were suspected of having communist affiliations. So um, quite a few folk musicians were uh, mentioned in Counterattack and in Red Channels. Uh, people like um, Oscar Brand and Josh White and uh, Josh White Sr. And, and Oscar Brand and Josh White were questioned by the FBI and they denounced the communists and they were basically left alone. Uh, uh, Paul Robeson and Earl Robinson were blacklisted as well. That is put on the uh, Red Channels list and this affected their careers. Earl Robinson was a absolutely uh, communist affiliated um, songwriter and Paul Robeson, of course, a singer and actor. Burl Ives was also listed in Counterattack and he was questioned and he named names. That was farther than most of these other guys went to salvage their career. And um, I just found this, a couple of quotes about Burl Ives that I think are kind of scathing <laughs> that I'll share with you. This first one from Erwin Silber, who was the editor of the folk music magazine Sing Out. Silber was, a, was a, uh, uh, quite the lefty. He says, the well-known folk singer who once joined in singing Solidarity Forever has a different tune today. It might be called Ballad for Stool Pigeons. The future of Burl Ives should be interesting. We've never seen anyone sing while crawling on his belly before. And then five years later, uh, Pete Seeger wrote this. Burl Ives went to Washington, D.C. a few years ago to the House Un-American Committee and fingered, like any common stool pigeon, some of his radical associates of the early 1940s. He did this not because he wanted to, but because he felt it was the only way to preserve his lucrative contracts. And that makes his action all the more despicable. And by the way, this appears in this book by Ronald D. Cohen. 
called Rainbow Quest, a history of the American folk revival. Uh, very exhaustive uh, and well-researched book. A little dry. Um, so, yeah, Carl writes, in last week's Q&A, we talked about Bruce Springsteen as a Woody Guthrie heir. I think I heard somewhere that it was on Springsteen's plane that Pete Seeger flew to Washington to sing at Obama's first inauguration. Did Springsteen play a role in reviving Seeger's work? Uh, and can you comment on their relationship? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that Springsteen is, is a latter day um, Guthrie revivalist, and it's something that uh, was the big theme for him. Um, for a while, I think it, it was a, um, it was kind of a, a concept that he used to frame an album project with by sort of dipping into the the Guthrie uh, songbook and uh, reviving interest in Guthrie. And definitely, he is a genuine admirer of Guthrie's work, and perhaps sees himself as a latter day exponent. Ellen writes, would you say there's a tension in folk music between the musicians who view the folk tradition as a way to address social problems in the present and those that view it as a way to preserve past cultures and traditions? Is that a tension you see playing out in the careers of some of the figures that we've been exploring and between different musicians or factions within the folk scene? Yes, Ellen, I would actually identify three main factions within the folk revival. One is the traditionalists that I just talked about, those who want to preserve the past. Very often they are, uh, and but not always, they are aligned to the right politically. The ones who want uh, topical songs and want songs to address injustices and issues today, they tend to be left-leaning and the commercialists, that's the ones that just want to hit. <laughs> so three main factions there. Now I see we're at uh, 1020, so I think we have to draw to a close. So thank you for joining us and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, as always, uh, great, great questions and, and even great, and of course, great answers from you. Um, look, Looking ahead to week four, I know you've got a lot of really interesting material on the docket. We're really heading into kind of the meat of the historical narrative you're building here. Just to give folks a little preview, we've got cameos from uh, Ian and Sylvia, Peter, Paul and Mary, uh, Joan Baez, Bob Dylan. Uh, things are heating up uh, in the folk yeah, it's revival. The boom. It's the folk boom that we're talking about uh, in the next lecture. So a lot of uh, familiar music. And um, uh, just an interesting thing when folk music collides with the popular music industry. Absolutely, absolutely. So we'll be seeing more of those different factions you were just talking about coming uh, together on a collision course. Uh, <laughs> so uh, folks, uh, thanks so much for checking in. Expect an email from me on Monday as soon as lecture four has been posted on our Hot Docs at Home platform. And in the meantime, Mike, thanks so much for joining us. and. Have a have a wonderful uh, have a wonderful weekend. You too. Thank you. Okay, see you next week.